Hey there, and welcome to the Confident Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Brooks. Join me as I sit down and chat with co-hosts, friends, and carefully curated guests and talk about all the things that empower you to become your best and most confident self. So let's get started. Hey there, and welcome back. Today we have a very special guest, Bess McCord. Bess is widely known as your Enneagram coach who shows how motherhood is divinely intended to be a transformative journey where moms not only help paint a portrait of their family, but also cultivate resilience, self-awareness, and deep connections with God, their spouse, and their children. In her book, The Enneagram for Moms, your Enneagram coach provides mothers with invaluable insights through the Enneagram, helping them better understand themselves and their children while fostering resilience. So welcome. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about you, your journey, and what got you into the works that you do today. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm Beth McCord. I live just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. I've been married to Jeff, my husband, for 29 years. We got married when we were 20, right after our sophomore year in college. And then we had both of our kiddos by the age of 25. So we definitely started out quickly. And yeah. And so... Sorry, I was focusing on the dog. What was the other questions you said? We were, what, brought, what brought you into the works that you do? Mark? Yeah, sure. we love unpacking stories. So if you yes. have a story, and I know you do because you have an incredible book. Yeah. So my expertise and what I focused a lot of my life on is the Enneagram. But I didn't do it for work or for a career. I did it because I needed it. So back when I was 26, Jeff and I had been married six years. We had both the kiddos. They were like one and three. You know, Jeff and I, though best friends, we kept hitting turbulence. And I was like, what's going on? Jeff would be really interested in like what I was thinking or feeling or why was I this way or that way? And I was just like, I, I don't know. I just am, you know, and that didn't really help to bridge gaps or have better understanding or clarity. And so one of our friends who was seeing the counselor at the time, the counselor gave him a book on the Enneagram and he said, hey, you might be interested in this. Jeff was in seminary at the time. So he kind of looked it over and thought, that's interesting, but he had a lot of other things to read. So I started to look at it and dove headlong into it. It made sense. It brought clarity. I found my type right away. I'm a type nine, the peaceful accommodator. And it helped me to understand, like, it's no wonder that I don't know myself because nines know themselves the least because we are constantly afraid of conflict and tension. So we, because we want peace and harmony, we go along to get along. And that makes us lose focus on ourselves. So we don't know ourselves well. This gave words to what I knew was in there, but I didn't know how to explain it. And that was just life changing. It was relationship changing. Now, I am still am using it. <laughs> I'm still learning about myself. So it's not like after all these years, I figured it all out. We're a work in progress and we get to constantly discover ourselves and explore who we are and how we've been made. That was the beginning of why I got into the Enneagram. But then as we saw our own marriage grow and our personal life grow, then when Jeff became a pastor, we started using it with couples in our church, just a little here and a little there. And we saw their relationships really transform and grow. And it was like, wow, this is so fascinating. And then, you know, kind of word got, you know, spread out. And so fast forward, that was like, that started working with couples around 2008. Fast forward to 2016, that's when I started Your Enneagram Coach. My desire was to help people understand themselves with astonishing clarity so they can break free from the shame, the self-condemnation, the fear that we all experience on a daily basis by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom they have with God. So that's kind of our path to take people. It's not just learn the Enneagram, end of story. No, we really want you to experience deep and lasting joy by getting to know yourself, but also deepening relationships with others and God. So that's kind of how it started, why it started. That's where we are today. I love that. I'm jotting down a couple of notes here because some of the things that you've already mentioned, I was like, oh, those were some of my questions I had for you. So I love that. And I think that's quite interesting because 
sometimes you don't realize that the things that you're called to do is something you had to discover in yourself first. Yeah. And and you just shared that how this book was gifted to your husband. And you said, well, I'm more fascinated. And you learn more about yourself, which opened up the doors and the opportunities for you to learn about your husband. And now you've been in this space for, let me math this for a moment here, eight years? Well, yeah, as as a professional, eight years. But that I started learning the Enneagram in 2001. So it's been a hot minute. <laughs> I had been in it way longer before it became like this really fun, cool thing to look at. But yeah, I just, but I was just kind of teed up for this moment of people really being interested in it. And the gift I really bring to the Enneagram space is, well, the Enneagram is a very complex tool. And, you know, it's got many layers and you can go really deep with it. But a lot of teachers have taught it with complexity. That's not where everybody is at. People okay. want to know things with simplicity, clarity, and how do I use it now? And that's really the gift that I bring to the Enneagram space. I love to break things down into these bite-sized lessons so they're digestible, they're easy to understand, and they're actionable right away. I think it makes it more fun because it's like, oh, I don't have to wade through these deep waters. I can literally just take it right now. I love that you break this down because as you're sharing that, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is probably me. Before I hit record, I was like, wait, I'm going to save my questions for this conversation. Sometimes it could feel like this big helix and it's so complex. We're hearing so much of, well, what's your Enneagram? And some people are like, well, what is an Enneagram? I'd love for you to share what that is for somebody who's like, how, how do you even spell this? What is that word? But before we, we unpack that, what is the Enneagram and how do you simplify that understanding of it? So the Enneagram, the word Enneagram, Ennea means nine, and gram is a drawing, a diagram. So when you look at the symbol, it is a nine-pointed geometric star or a geometric figure. On our logo, we have put dots on each of the points of the star because each of the points of that nine-pointed star is one of the basic personality types. And so there's nine basic personality types, and we just call them type one, type two, so on and so forth. Even though we know most teachers and I have names for them, we typically just go by the, the number to keep it all neutral. Because sometimes people have biases even to the words that are associated to it, either good biases or negative biases. So using the numbers are more beneficial. Also, not one number is better than the other. Just because you're a type one doesn't mean you're the best and type nine's the worst. There's no hierarchy in it. Every one of the personality types at their healthiest is the most remarkable people. And when they're all at their worst, they're all the worst. <laughs> There's no one personality that is better than the other. They're just different. Think of each of those dots as having different colors. And that's what our logo represents. Each of these lenses are a different color. I don't know your type yet. Well, maybe we'll find out today. But let's just say you're wearing green lenses and I'm wearing purple lenses. We grow up with these lenses. I, I believe we're born our type. So we were born with these glasses on, whether we're recognizing it or not, and we're experiencing the world through them, we're interpreting the world through them, and then we're reacting to the world through those lenses. Each Enneagram type is a valid perspective of the world. It's just a different perspective. And that's really important to understand because oftentimes <laughs> we are annoyed with other people because it's like, why would they say that? Why did they do that? I would never do or say that or think that. Well, they're coming from a different perspective. It's like if you and I were in a room and you're by the door and I'm by the chalkboard and she writes something really small and you might not even see it, or you might see it just as something on the chalkboard, but you can't really read it. And I can read it clearly. And I could be like, well, why can't you read that? It's right there. And you're like, but I'm not close enough, or I'm seeing it from a different perspective. And that's what we really want people to know is that we are seeing, interpreting, and reacting to the world with different lenses on. And what those lenses are, or why we do what we do, that's what the Enneagram is all about. Why do you do what you do? And it's because you have core motivations. There are four core motivations to each of the nine Enneagram types. You have a core fear. This is what you're constantly running away from or trying to prevent. You have a core desire. Your thought is, if I have this, obtain it, 
life will be just as I hoped. You have a core weakness. This is your Achilles heel, the thorn in your side, the constant problem you're struggling with, and that you have a core longing. This is the message your heart longs to hear. And it's those four core motivations that you are literally seeing, interpreting, and reacting to the world through. It's going to help you understand the why behind all that you do. And so people are constantly like, how do I find my type? Sometimes I feel like this type or that type. I always tell them, go back to the core motivations because we use all nine types to varying degrees, but your main type reigns supreme with its core motivations. Anyone listening right now can go to your enneagramcoach.com forward slash core motivations, and they can get a free PDF download with all nine types core motivations. And maybe you can look through them, read through them, and then rank them one to nine, not as in type one to nine, but all oh, this is totally like me and see where you land. And it's a process because some people know themselves well, some people don't. So it may take time, but ultimately your main type resides with the core motivations. When you understand your core motivations, you can use the Enneagram like an internal GPS. So you've got your main location. Let's say my healthiest place that I could be is in Columbus, Ohio. I'm putting in the coordinate like, yay, here we go. This is what it would look like if I'm there. But often when we're driving on the road of life, we get distracted. We veer off course, not even knowing it sometimes. But wouldn't it be great if we had that internal GPS that alerts us like, hello, to get back on track, you want to go this way. And that's how we can use the Enneagram because the Enneagram is showing you what your type is like at its healthiest when it's kind of an average autopilot mode and when it's unhealthy. And what we're trying to help people accept where they are without shame and judgment so that they can move in the direction that is most healthy for them, how they've been created to be not someone else, but just them. So that's in a nutshell how I teach the Enneagram. And it sounds so simple. You're obviously the most experience that I've encountered because it felt very complex and heavy where I was just like, I don't know, that that's, I don't even understand it. And so sometimes you don't want to approach it because it yeah. feels so complex. I just want to thank you for breaking that down. And it was so simple and easy to understand. You broke it down into the simplest bite-sized pieces. Anyone who's listening, I hope that really helps you. This is why you do what you do. And what's really cool is you can stay with the core motivations forever and learn a ton, grow a ton, even if all you focused on was your core motivations and what those look like when you're healthy to unhealthy, you will get far in life. But you can geek out all you want, learn about the wings, which are the two numbers next to you and how they affect your type. Each number is connected to two other types through the lines. They affect you. You don't become those types, but they flavor your personality like salt and pepper in different ways and in different circumstances. And also, depending on if you're healthy or unhealthy, they chime in. So you can take it as far as you want to go. But if anything, if people just recognize, oh, there are nine valid ways of seeing, interpreting, and reacting to the world. My lens isn't the only lens. So what is my spouse is types? What is my children's types? What is my boss, my employees, my friends types? And can I take off my lens for a second and put their lens on? Or maybe I don't know their type, but at least I now know there's a high probability they're not my type. So they see it differently. But even if they are my type, we have different stories. We have different backgrounds, different talents, different desires, callings, etc. So yes, we might have the same core motivations, but we're still different. Think about each of those colors that each of the types, okay? And you go into Trouble and Williams and let's say I'm looking for purple, which purple, right? Periwinkle, lavender, deep, dark purple. What are you looking for? And the reason why that's important is because when you start recognizing how some of the other types influence you, then you can think, oh, I have a little splash of that type's color and a little splash of this type's color. And though I'm still purple, these different types are definitely shaping the nuances and the complexity that each of us are. And that's why I think the Enneagram is so beautiful and so powerful because, yes, 
us nines, we do have the same core motivations, but we're different shades of that same personality type. And so it gives us uniqueness. It helps us to think more specifically about us versus, oh, I got to be like everyone else. No, you are unique. And that uniqueness is beautiful. And so that's where the Enneagram can get super fun. And yes, it's complex. But if you learn from someone like me, it's just fun. It's like, oh, there's a piece of the puzzle. Let's put that here. And then you just get to know yourself better. You get to know others better. And it's just more tools in your tool belt. I think that's what's unique about it. It validates and allows you to be seen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Total validation in not just validation in your healthy places. Of course, we all want to be healthy and experience that health, but that also validates where we are when we're in autopilot or unhealthy. That was probably my biggest aha moment in life change when I realized the importance of the levels of health in the Enneagram because most of us are fixated on our weaknesses or where we're struggling. And in part, that's good. I talk about the Enneagram, like driving down the highway, and we veer off and land into a common pitfall where we throw up our hands and pull our hair. Did I not learn this? Why am I here again? So there's a lot of shame and judgment towards ourselves. With the Enneagram, you're like, your personality is going to commonly fall into that particular pitfall. That is just the way your personality is wired. And also, your, when it's at its best, it looks like this over here. And it's amazing. So what if we put rumble strips on your highway, your internal understanding of yourself, so that when you start to disassociate or you're not focused on what's going on and you're just living life and not paying attention and you start to veer off course, thinking that these behaviors, these thoughts, these tendencies will get you what you want, but they've never done that, <laughs> only making you fall into that common pitfall. What if you were now to put down those rumble strips, those warning signs, those aha moments of, oh, wait, when I actually do that, it causes these things to happen. Now, that's my tendency, so I don't have to shame or guilt myself. That's just the way I veer off course. So what if I hear that rumble strip? Now, I have a choice to make. I can either just keep going, <laughs> which I normally do, or what are some healthier ways that my type can get back on to the road in a healthier direction? And that's really how I'm trying to help people because the more we shame ourselves and guilt ourselves, even when we hit that rumble strip, it's like taking the wheel and we just pull it to the right and <laughs> fall into the pitfall even faster and harder. And so what if we did it differently? Like what if we recognized, no, my personality is truly a blessing to myself and others when it's healthy and it can be destructive and harmful when it's unhealthy. And I get the opportunity to self-regulate, to understand myself and help myself get back on the healthiest path. Whether anyone else is helping or supporting, I can do this work. Now, of course, it's great when other people are helping and encouraging, but we are responsible for our own growth. And so this is what I'm trying to help people to do. And like, especially even with this new book, Enneagram for Moms, is to show them. So for me as a type nine, I'll give you an example, I can impart to my kids some really beautiful aspects. I'm empathetic, compassionate, thoughtful, kind, warm, non-judgmental, receptive. I'm thinking of others usually before myself. Those are really amazing qualities. But that can slip into this unhealthy pattern where I veer off course and become a doormat. I can become massive, going along to get along, not speaking up for myself, making everyone else more important than me. Not only is that harmful for me, that is harmful for others, even my kids, because they're going to be thinking, well, that's how I need to be. So when I start to veer off course and start to recognize that I'm doing those patterns, I need to recognize that and help get myself back on a healthier trajectory. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Because sometimes what we don't realize that we would coin that as healthy could go to that next level if it's not managed or the awareness level of it. So I, and here's the thing, I would say most of us think that 
when we're starting to head off into an unhealthy pattern and we're like heading for that common pitfall, we actually think those are healthy patterns because that's all we've ever known. Those are the strategies we use as children. It helped us to get to where we are today, but they are not helpful anymore. For me, I constantly think, okay, so it's good to put others first. It's good to not have a strong opinion. And then I start to get off course, but I'm like, oh, I'm being accommodating and helpful and kind. And then all of a sudden I'm in the pit. Like, how did I get here? Because I didn't have those rumble strips or I wasn't paying attention to the rumble strips. I was just veering off and just going right over it without listening to it. Now, here's the thing. When you fall in a common pitfall and you've set up those rumble strips or there was a rumble strip somewhere, you can take time later when you're not in shame, frustration or pity. When you're in a neutral space, you can go, huh, I wonder where that rumble strip was or where could it have been so that I didn't go too far off course, okay? And that is so valuable. So like for me with my kids, I get really worked up when they're frustrated or sad or whining because nines think, well, I just need to make people happy. Okay, well, that's great if people are happy, but that isn't the end game, especially as parents. And so When I start to feel this pull to making my kids happy at the expense of anything else, that can be my rumble strip. Like, wait, hold on. You have good intentions, but they also need boundaries. They also need to be shown a better and healthier way to express themselves. My natural self just wants to give in, but the healthier self is like, no, keep going over here because all growth is hard, right? It's challenging, it's stretching. And so for me, I have to stretch myself to let my kids know, hey, I hear you, but a better way to have said that is this way. And mom is here to listen to you. And I can't always make you happy, but I am here to listen to you and validate what you're feeling. And so that is really what we need to be focusing on instead of harping on more shame because it just doesn't work. I I love that you brought that up because We can have these healthy parameters, but sometimes our healthy parameters go to almost a default where we're sacrificing pieces of ourselves. And that's the rumble strip that you bring in, which is the awareness. So like that's what the type nine does. But if I was a type eight, they're the passionate protectors. I talk about them being big diesel snowplows and you being up in Ohio. If you don't have those diesel snowplows, you aren't getting anywhere. The reason I call them snowplows is because they were created to plow a path for others the way that no one else can do it. We need those people. Now, when they're becoming more in autopilot mode, they're starting to nick cars on the side of the road and everyone's like, dude, hey, that hurt. And they're kind of like, well, don't you see I'm plowing? Like, why are you there? You know, so they're going about their gifting without recognizing people around them. When they're really unhealthy, they're like, I don't care. I need to plow a path. And if you're in the way, here I come. But the reason why I show that example is that is how beautiful all the night types are, but differently. Because a snowplow is amazing when it's used correctly, and it can be absolutely destructive when used incorrectly. For the type 8, they might be coming down the road with that big diesel snowplow, and they're going to start to veer off course when they feel they're being controlled challenged, manipulated, and at the mercy of injustice. They're going to start to protect themselves because they don't want to be betrayed or blindsided. Those feelings are rising. They're going to put on strong armor and be very intense. They're going to say it like it is. They're going to be direct. They're going to be strong. Anger will come out. They'll be confrontational. And others might be like feeling nicked on the side of the highway or plowed over. And it's like, what in the world? But they're thinking that's the right way to do it because that's how they've always done it to protect themselves as kids. Mm-hmm. But now certain strategies are no longer helpful. So for an eight, we want them to be a snowplow. We don't want that to change. We're not trying to edit them. I know a lot of society does paint that picture like stop because they'll call them bulldozers. Don't be a bulldozer or a bull in a china shop. It's like, no, let's look at them more correctly for who they are, and then let's get them back on a healthier path. So when an eight starts to feel intense, big, wanting to challenge, protect, that's a great rumble strip in the sense to assess, am I doing this with the recognition that there's cars in front of me and around me? 
And am I getting them to go behind me and plowing a path for them? Or am I just going because I'm protecting myself or I'm protecting my kids or these people around me that are so important, but I don't care about anyone else. That's their rumble strip. And they then can learn new skills of what it looks like to still be an amazing snowplow, but in a way that is actually for people versus hurting against people. Does that kind of make sense how it can be so different? Like that is a totally different thing than what I'm struggling with. A thousand percent. It's almost like you need to in- empower them to be in an environment where they thrive. Exactly. For me, it is not helpful to be in an environment where people either coach me to be codependent and accommodating or let's say a narcissist, like they're going to totally take advantage of someone like me who will just go along to get along. Because I ultimately, the false message in my mind is my presence doesn't matter. My voice doesn't matter. Someone else can come in and say, well, I matter. And I want you to do this, that, and the other. As nines, if we're not healthy, we'll go, oh, I guess that's what I need to do. I need to be in atmospheres where people know me well enough to say, you matter. Your voice matters. I'm not going to let you just go along to get along. I want you to be an important voice just like everyone else. We want to set ourselves up well for that. We want to set up aids really well in a sense that that we see when they feel controlled, when they feel not protected, that we can come in and help stand in that gap the best that we can as humans and be there a stronghold, a foundation, a rock, you know, a protector for them. If they can feel safe around us and know that we understand and see them, because they're some of the most tender on the Enneagram, they put this really strong armor on. If you're able to see, you have a really tender heart. We don't see it all the time, but I want that to shine forth. And I'm going to give you that protective space to be who you are. They will go there. Now, they're not going to go there with everyone because, you know, there's a lot of fear. Of course, AIDS are like, I'm not afraid. But there is fear of being vulnerable, being controlled and harmed. And so we want to set them up the best we can. As moms, if we understand all nine types, we may not know our kids' types because your kids have to find their own core motivations. Even if you don't know your kid's type, you at least know there's these nine personality types with nine valid perspectives. And if I know a little bit of all of them, then I can be curious. I can ask good questions. I can't put them in a box. But I can definitely be holding a couple of numbers loosely in my mind. I think they could be these things. And so we can kind of be good students of our kids and try to set them up the best that we can and ask questions like, hey, you know, when mom did this, was that helpful or what would have been helpful? Like what would have helped you to feel loved? And that's where the core longing, the message of your your heart longs. If every parent just were to communicate all nine of them, you're going to hit one of them and it's going to mean the world to them. And watch, maybe even say them once a night or nine nights and just see their expression and how it impacts them. And that is a great way because the type eight, the message they long to hear is you will not be betrayed. I don't want to be betrayed. And that would be nice if my parents said that, but it really wouldn't do a ton for me. If my parent looked at me and they like it. So as an eight, if they said, you will not be betrayed, I am here to protect you. If my parents looked at me and said, "Eh, your presence matters, your voice matters, I love it, and I want you to show up, I would fall apart. Now, I'm sure everyone listening is like, I would like that too, but there's a difference when it is your absolute core longing and it's been directly said to you. It's like we are a parched desert just waiting, looking, searching for someone to say this message. And that's where usually kids kind of go off and try to, and they find other friends or communities that will give what they think they want when parents can actually be the source for that. We can be a safe place and a source for that. I, I love that you're breaking this down in such tangible pieces. And you mentioned nines and eights. Can you give us a quick recap of seven through one? As you're sharing that, you're talking about the two different messages and we're just using those two as examples. That was something that was really speaking to me. It's like, I I think that I'm empathetic or I want to know that my presence matters, but then I'm also guarded and protected. It kind of brings me to my original question before we hit record. Sometimes when we can read those quote unquote horoscopes, we say, oh, that's speaking to me. 
because yeah. they can just see like the flavor of the day yeah. or the, how the wind blows. So how do we? And that's what's so each Enneagram type has two mm-hmm. wings and those are the two numbers directly next to each number. So the type two next to it is the one and the three next to the nine, because I sit at the very top of that star next to me is one and eight. And so one and eight actually are parts of me, but I don't become them. They flavor my personality. Well, sometimes I have a lot more eight in me than one, and sometimes I have a lot more one than eight. For instance, when I'm at work, I get a lot more one-ish. I want details. I want things right. Not I want things right. The eight, they're more big picture, and I might become more protective or assertive in that space, but I'm still a nine. I'm still going to do it from a nine's perspective. And then there's the two lines that go off and we have two other numbers that we're connected to and those also influence us. So that's why you might be reading different types and go, well, I do some of that and I do some of this. So let's get to the core motivations. I'll go through the nine types quickly. And again, this is why getting that PDF at yourenagramcoach.com forward slash core motivations will be great because you're probably going to, it's like a fire hose right now. And so this way you'll have time. Just try to Think about yourself more in a moment when you're activated, okay? Not maybe the worst activation, but what's making you activate, okay? So think about that. The type one is the principled reformer. They fear being wrong, bad, evil, corrupt. They desire to be good, balanced, ethical, moral, and right. But they struggle with the core weakness of resentment. Resentment is they have this one loud inner critic that's constantly berating them for the imperfections in themselves and the world. But they think everyone else sees the world the way they do. No one else is being the adult (laughs) and helping fix things. They have resentment. Now, they long to hear, you are good. The type two is the nurturing supporter. They fear being rejected, unwanted, unneeded, dispensable, and unloved. They desire to be appreciated, loved, and wanted. They struggle with the core weakness of pride. They have these spidey senses that can see other people's needs and feel their feelings. They feel they have to insert themselves into other people's lives and help, assist, guide, advise. Because if they don't, when they've seen the need and they feel the need, if they don't insert themselves, they fear others will think they're selfish and then reject them. And so what they long to hear is you are loved and wanted. The type three is the admirable achiever. They fear being exposed, a failure, worthless. They desire to be a successful, to have a high status, to be admired and high regard. They struggle with the core weakness of deceit. Deceit here means that they're deceiving themselves into believing that they're only the image they present to others. They don't believe that they can be loved unless they achieve something. It can be the littlest thing to the biggest thing. They're constantly making lists and goals to get from one place to the other. If they don't think people are seeing that, they'll let people know what they've accomplished. Now, other people can think that's bragging, but they don't think that you would know why you should love them. So they got to tell you. For them, what they long to hear is you are loved simply being you. You don't have to accomplish anything. The type four is the introspective individualist. They fear being plain, mundane, and ordinary. They desire to be their most authentic self, different, special, unique. They struggle with the core weakness of envy and have a ton of emotions, highs and lows. They're introspective But they feel that there's something tragically flawed and missing in them, but others have it. So think about this puzzle that you're putting together. And it's going to be amazing. It's creative. It's unique. And then you get to that last piece and it's missing. And it's like, well, now it's ruined, you know. But then you look at other people's puzzles and they're all done and beautiful and complete. Well, what's wrong with me? Why do I have this missing piece? And so fours feel that there's something wrong and that they don't belong. But they long to hear You are seen and known and loved for exactly who you are, special and unique. The type five is the analytical investigator, and they fear being ignorant, incompetent, worthless, and incapable. They desire to have knowledge, 
to move forward and to be capable and competent in the world. But they struggle with the core weakness of avarice. Now, avarice usually means greedy with money, but they're actually greedy with their inner resources and energy. And why is because they only have so much interactive battery life. And so they fear catastrophic depletion of that energy. So think about us all having a cell phone battery, like in, internally, that's your interactive battery life. They wake up with only about 20 to 25% interactive battery life, and they don't know when they're going to get to charge it up again. They need time alone to process their thoughts and feelings to recharge. So they're going to be a lot more protective of their time, their inner resources, their energy. And especially when they get down to that two or three or 5%, like, nope, I'm done. And others can feel like that's cold or they're aloof or they're too withdrawn and isolated. But if you understand what's going on, you're like, oh, that totally makes sense. Now, what they long to hear is your needs are not a problem. The type six is the faithful guardian. They fear fear itself. They fear not having guidance, security, and support. They fear being blamed, targeted, and alone or abandoned. They long to be secure, guided, and supported. But they struggle with the core weakness of anxiety. Now, everyone can be anxious, but where this is coming from, instead of one loud inner critic, they have an inner committee that is chiming in from all different perspectives. What about this? What about that? Did you think of this? Did you think of that? This could happen. That could happen. Their mind is just swimming all over the place. They look outside themselves for truth, for guidance, for security, support. But they could struggle with even trusting others. They have self-doubt. They can also have others doubt. And they long to hear you are safe and secure. But type seven is our enthusiastic optimists. They fear being bored, limited, stuck in emotional pain, deprived and missing out on something fun. They're the true FOMOs of the world and desire to be happy, satisfied, and fully content. But they struggle with the core weakness of gluttony. It's not just about food. It's a gluttony of life, stimulation, excitement. They fear boredom or being stuck in emotional pain or distress. They're always off reframing everything to the positive. What they long to hear is you will be taken care of. The type eight is a passionate protector, and they fear being controlled, harmed, and left at the mercy of injustice. They desire to protect themselves and their small inner circle, and they struggle with lust and excess. It's, again, like that big diesel snowplow. They're so powerful. They're intense. They can feel intimidating, and at times, they can just plow without recognition of who's around. They want what they want, and they're going to get it. They long to hear, you will not be betrayed. And last but not least is my type, the peaceful accommodator. We fear conflict of any kind, tension, being overlooked, and in any kind of discord. We want or desire inner stability and peace of mind. But we struggle with the core weakness of sloth. Sloth is an internal sloth, not physical, because we can be very busy, but it's a not knowing ourselves because we're going along to get along, thinking that's going to bring peace and harmony. What we long to hear is your presence matters. So that's all nine types in their core motivations. That's why they do what they do. This is so informative. I'm jotting down a bunch of these notes and I think, okay, that sounds like me. And it's hard to really pinpoint. We we'll definitely have to check out your website and learn more about how this fits into who you are. You can identify with any of those nine and recognizing those wings are there to support you, but helping you keep in your lane so yes. that you can really thrive in that environment. Yep. I love that. And so but you talk about how you describe the Enneagram is like that onion. You're peeling back those layers. You're discovering pieces of yourself. You're learning the ins and outs, the intricacies, and that really hits on the head of self-awareness. And that's a big piece of what you do. Because a lot of times we think we know ourselves, but do we really, right? We don't. Even those on the Enneagram that really take pride that they know themselves, they actually really don't. And that's not to put them down. It's actually an invitation that you don't fully know yourself. And there is a map. There is clarity that you can use to really know yourself and become a healthier version of who you were created to be. Yes. 
And so that kind of leads me into, because I, I know that we, you had mentioned this came up early on in your relationship with your husband. He was going through the pastoral school, lots of books. Obviously, he had to read the number one greatest book in the world, you know, to learn about that. As a Christian, how does faith play a part of this yeah. as well? You touched upon it as an individual and then also as a parent. But when we look at our Heavenly Father to us as unique individuals and created in his image and passed on to our children, can you shine some light onto that? Because sometimes yeah. people might think, well, this is weird that I'm going to a different book to learn about right. myself when this is the, the truth in right. the world. Well, the Enneagram is an amazing tool, but it is the gospel that transforms us. So we can throw out the Enneagram at any point. We can throw out pretty much all the books that authors write because they themselves aren't, you know, scripture. So it is a tool of many tools and resources out there. The cool thing about it, when you use it from a Christian perspective, so when when I started using the Enneagram back in 2001, most of the teachers, well, all teachers use the Enneagram from their own perspective, their own worldview, their own faith. And so that's why you see a wide range of Enneagram books and teaching because it's not just one hub. When I was uh, learning it, I was like, huh, see the truth in this, but I don't agree with how they worded this. That's a different worldview. So because my husband had four years of seminary, I was like, how would we see this through our Christian lens? And he would nuance it. And I was like, right, totally. So we did that for 15 years. And then when we started Your Enneagram Coach, we were able to bring all of that more nuanced, filtered into what is truth in that way. How the Enneagram used under the truth can be so helpful is, and this is where transformation happens. When you recognize that you have a core longing. So Jeremiah 2.13 says, we have forsaken, you have forsaken me, the spring of living water. You have dug your own cisterns, cistern, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. A cistern's like a pool. It's something that you dig. There's no fresh water that comes up. You got to put water into it. And it was used back in the day in cities that they would have to close up the cities when maybe they were attacked. So they had to have some sort of water supply. Well, it gets stagnant. Animals would get in it. It's, it's just all kind of gross. But they were broken. God's saying they're broken. Well, if your pool has cracks in it, it's no longer a pool. <laughs> it's not going to hold water. So then that's what we do. It's like, oh, I'm going to go dig a pool here. That didn't work. I'm going to go dig a pool here. So we start to look for our core longing in other places. We look for it from our jobs, our grades, our spouse, our kids, clothes, whatever you want to put into it. Those are the things that we're trying to get this core longing from. But he says he's the spring of living water. And so when you recognize, oh, wait, Christ has already completed everything that I needed. The victory's been won. Now, yes, we're on earth, so it's the already but not yet. We have all the blessings and not all quite yet. We'll get that complete version when we're with him. So while we're here, what does that mean? As a type nine, I long to hear your presence matters. I walk through all nine types and how Christ has already satisfied their core longing. I'll go through them really quickly. The type one wants to hear you are good. None of us are good and we all have sinned. But when we trust in Christ, he gives us his righteousness. So it's not that we are good, but when he looks at us, we are good because of his righteousness put on us. Type twos long to hear you are wanted and loved. God left his throne to come and bring you into relationship with him. You are not rejected. In fact, you are absolutely pursued and brought back to him. Type three longs to hear you are loved for simply being you. You don't have to accomplish something because he accomplished it all. It's finished. And therefore, he gives his accomplishments to you. You can actually rest and feel the love. The type four longs to hear you are uh, seen, known, and loved for exactly who you are, special and unique. He created you with delight, with intricacies. You think you know yourself? He really knows you and fully accepts you. The type five longs to hear your needs are not the problem. God is the God of the universe. Your needs are literally not a problem. In fact, he it's a joy and delight 
for him to provide for you, just like a good shepherd provides for his sheep. Type six is long to hear you are safe and secure. And again, he's God Almighty. Nothing is out of his reach. And in fact, when we are in relationship with him, he says that it's like we are in his hand and even in God's covering. And it's like, yeah, nothing is going to take us from him. Yes, I know. We don't know from day to day on earth what's going to happen, but our eternal security and relationship with him is solid and we are safe and protected in that. The type seven lungs to hear you will be taken care of. Sevens feel like they didn't get what they needed. So they're always in search for the next fun thing. Actually, you have been provided all that you need. So looking for that contentment, that satisfaction, that joy. Christ gives that freely and fully. He is that spring of living water. Keep going back to him and you will be nourished. The type eight wants to know that you will not be betrayed. Christ was the most betrayed. He understands what that feels like. Therefore, he will not forsake you. He will protect you. Everything has been accomplished. And for us nines, we long to hear that your presence matters. I don't know of a better way to say your presence matters than to leave heaven, come to earth, live a perfect life, die a brutal death, and rise again to bring someone back into relationship with him. So when I focus for myself as a nine on that message and what has already happened on my behalf, I feel seen and loved and cared for. And I think all the other nine types or the other eight types will feel the same when they focus in on how their core longing has been complete. So if it's been complete, we don't have to dig these cisterns anymore. Not to say that we won't. We're humans. We're still here on earth. We don't have to dig those cisterns because they're not going to provide. We can keep coming back to the spring of living water and know that we will never run thirsty anymore. Does that make sense how you can use it? A hundred percent. Yes. This is why I'm digging this conversation because it's so tangible and so easy to understand. For the first time, I'm so overwhelmed by it. You talk about all of this stuff inside your book, which is the Enneagram for moms. When we talk about the lineage from our Heavenly Father to ourselves, to what we pass on to our children as parents, you're taking this practice and just how you put this in simple forms. You're teaching this not only to other individuals, but how to be better parents. Yeah. So I love my Share more about the book. Yeah. You, you shared a lot of what's in the book today at uh, conversation. Yeah. But let's talk about the book for a moment and unpack more of what's in the content of the book specifically for moms as parents. So for us moms, when we're talking from an Enneagram lens, we think our lens is the right way to live. <laughs> so we want to raise our kids in that lens, right? Like... Why wouldn't I raise my kids to be empathetic, compassionate, easygoing, and accommodating? Like, that's the way everyone should be, peaceable. And so we tend to, without knowing, not only it's good to impart those qualities and traits, it's a whole nother thing to try to create versions of ourselves or our ideals. Because we might have, let's say we have eight children and all eight are not our type. Well, who are they? God tells us to raise our kids in the way they should go. They're bent. Well, we may or may not know their type, but they have a bent. How can I give the best of who I am while also keeping my hands open and curious about who they are? Let's take the example again. The nine and the eight, the reason why I use those examples is they're just so different from each other. So me as a type nine mom, I'm going to want my kids to be little angels and flexible and accommodating and, and kind and soft-spoken. Well, if I have a type eight daughter, that is just not how she was made. She was made to be strong, to be tenacious, to plow those paths, to challenge what's true, uh, to not um, be conformed to other things. If that's the lens I saw, if I only saw through my lens, I would point that as being wrong and bad. But now I can go, hmm, there's nine types, nine different lenses. I think that she's looking through the world through a different lens. She has different gifts and, and personality. So how can I be curious to and ask curious questions about them along the way and nurture what I see? For instance, let's say that type eight daughter is Jane. Jane, you are so strong. And I can see that you are trying to protect your friend, but you're being really strong with this other person. Even though I know that you think that they're not being kind to your friend, let's learn how to be protective in a way that's beneficial for everyone. 
So do you see how that can go? I can bring my peaceful mediation into the process, help her see different viewpoints and edit her out of her personality. Now, let's say I don't know that she's a type eight, but I can see the strength. And so we want to highlight for our kids the goods that we see. It's just like a gun. A gun can be good and a gun can be bad. In the right hands of a police officer could be really helpful. In the arms of a criminal, it's destructive. So we want to look at our kids' personality and highlight the good of those attributes, but also help them to understand where they might be going awry and help them to set up rumble strips. Again, whether we know their type or not, there's certain things that you can just see. So how can we come alongside them and support them who they are versus trying to create these little mini versions of ourselves and painting the picture of like, I just don't understand you or you're not my child or I've never taught you that. Well, yeah, maybe. They might be completely different and that's okay. So the ultimate thing in this book is learning your own developmental story as a mom. Who are you? Why are you the way you are in the healthy and in the unhealthy? How can you set up these rumble strips? Because when you can self-regulate, when you understand yourself, you can come into a space, even in chaos, even in frustration, even in loudness and everyone's arguing or crying, If you can self-regulate and understand what's setting you off, you can enter into those spaces because you've not only nurtured yourself, but you've also gone to the spring of living water. You can bring a new perspective versus just being anxious, overwhelmed, angry, sad, or self-focused, or others-focused. I mean, every personality is just different. So who are you? Where are your hangups? Where are your weaknesses? But also... How are you the most beautiful person that God created you to be to radiate him to your kids? And that's where I want moms to enter into this new space that you are fully seen and loved for who you are. God did not make a mistake in creating you with your personality for your kids. I got two kids and there are two and a six. God didn't make a mistake that he gave those two kids a type nine mom. So if that's true, how can I use my personality in the best way to set them up, but also support them in who they are. This book really is focusing on the inner work of us moms so that we can bring the greatest gift to our kids. I love that. And the whole time you're sharing this, I'm thinking, going back to scripture and just knowing who you are and who you're created by the greatest creator of this whole world and universe, we are always students of life. When we become the teacher, we have to become that student first and know ourselves. So with that philosophy, to thine own self be true. So we need to know that because as you shared, it's not about looking at them and saying, well, why aren't you this way or creating many versions of you? So when you can learn the depths and the intricacies of who you are, you now take that shifted lens and a perspective to shift outward and say, oh, I see you for who you are, not who I choose for you to be. The simplicity of how you break things down is just wonderful. So that obviously is a gift that you've been given. And you're able to do this with the clients that you work with, through the coaching, through through the book, obviously, as well. But I would love as we wrap up today's conversation, if there's anything we hadn't talked about that you definitely want to highlight, I'd love for you to take a moment to share. Yeah, I think the one thing that weighs on me the most and the reason why I wrote this book was really writing it to myself. Because when I started using the Enneagram, when my kids were one and three and I was 26 years old, I was really struggling. One of the first stories in the book is about where I was struggling. We were in seminary and lived on seminary campus with all the other for seminarians. We go to the playground just outside and I would look at all the moms and go, oh, she is so strong and assertive. Wow. Oh, that mom over there, she's so creative and she's really able to meet her kids emotionally. And that mom over there, she's so spontaneous and fun. And then I would be like, and then there's me, you know, and I'd go home. I know myself and like, I don't have all those great qualities. I've talked to my husband and he said, Pat, You're taking the best of who these people are and creating one big super mom, super woman that doesn't exist. She doesn't exist. And you're comparing yourself to her. And you don't even know what she is struggling with behind closed doors. She's coming to the playground just like you, putting on her best foot forward. And you don't know what she is struggling with. 
And I was like, wow, you're so right. And that was back in 2001. That was before the internet was really humming along. There was no social media. We didn't have cell phones. There was no texting going on. We weren't bombarded with all of these messages with influencers and platforms. And you should be like this. No, you should be like that. No, the mom should be like this. Use disposable diapers. Don't use disposable diapers. You should breastfeed. It's just like, oh my word. And I think that moms are just so bombarded to question themselves, guilt themselves, shame themselves, compare themselves. One of my first counselors said, Beth, what comparison is doing, either you're putting someone up on a pedestal. So you're like, oh, they're so much better than me for all these other reasons. Or you're pushing someone down like, well, I would never do that for whatever reason. And she said, but ultimately, all you're doing is pushing people out of your life. And I was like, wow, yes. And so I want this book to be a book, like a new book of motherhood. I want it to be a book where mothers embrace who they've been created to be. That when God put us on earth before the fall, we were created to radiate him in our own unique way. Unfortunately, yes, we're on this side of the fall and we're not quite there, but we have amazing qualities. So why not we focus on that and celebrate that while, yes, also focusing on our weaknesses, giving that to him and working through those, but that we're not wallowing in them, that we're not shaming ourselves. And that's why my whole mission statement is, that the Enneagram is to help you to understand yourself with astonishing clarity so you can break free from self-condemnation, fear, and shame by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom in Christ. And that's my invitation to moms. You are okay being you. You don't have to become someone else. So let's focus on you becoming a healthier version of yourself and that the ripple effects of that will bless your kids, your marriage, your community at large. And you are welcomed and loved for just who you are. So that's really what I want moms to feel when they enter in reading this book and what they feel ultimately when they're done. I love that you shared that because it's such a great message. And I think that that really is the mission at heart and the livelihood of being, again, a student and the teacher, but as a mom, and especially as a woman, yeah. because we are bombarded by so many things of who we should be, what we shouldn't do, how we should speak, how we should look, how we should think, how we should act. And it's so overwhelmingly confusing that you freeze, right? Because you're like, if, if I can't be it, then I will just be nothing. And that's the exactly. nothing I am. And you start perceiving that about yourself. So I love that you take this whole different approach to personal development, self-help, self-improvement in a way that allows the individual to have a light shined on them and see the intricacies and the details of their uniqueness as yeah. strengths and, and not weaknesses. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So of course, how can our listeners learn more about you and get yeah. their hands on property? Everything is at yourenneagramcoach.com and Instagram, your Enneagram Coach. We have a podcast, your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. And you can find the book through there. But if you're just wanting like a short, quick cut to it, just go to Enneagram for Moms Com. We've got plenty of retailers for you to choose from to get the book and other fun goodies and resources to help you along your way. We want moms to enter in to this new conversation of fully embracing who they are, loving how God created them, recognizing that they do have a lot of work to do but that they can learn how to repair, apologize with their kids, spouses, friends, knowing they're already free. They're free. They're loved. Everything's been accomplished. So we can enter in this whole new space. I hope people will not only get the book, but really engage with the book so that this will have ripple effects everywhere. Yes, I love that. And of course, all that will be in the show notes below. So be sure to check that out and give Beth a follow. And if, if you get your hands on a copy of the book, be sure to reach out and let her know. I'm sure she'd be excited to learn what Enneagram you are because that's part of the journey. Once you find it, it's like, ooh, I'm seen. And that's the cool part of what you do. Thank you so much for being our guest. Hey there. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the Confident Woman Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did, please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Thanks again for listening. 